So um, I get to speak to you today in the series called Making Space. And I'm just going to give a really quick recap of what the weeks have looked like so far. In week one, Pastor Terry shared with us about making space and how God has space for all of us. There's room at his table for all of us, and there's room in his kingdom. And week two, Pastor Austin spoke about the kingdom is near. It was a message of repentance and how revival is evidenced by repentance or a turning around, right? Week three was about family the fireplace of revival and how revival is in communities by sharing our testimonies and by living in community, which we do largely in our house parties and just throughout our weeks. So that was so good. And week four, we had the privilege of having Laurel Ellis here, who's a missionary to Ecuador. And man, she had a powerful word called on purpose and how, um, God has a calling on our lives, and our purpose is in Christ. And week five was a passion for the lost, a burden for the lost. It was about plundering hell and about how every person has the right to hear the word of God. But how are they going to hear if we aren't preaching the word? And last week, Pastor Sherry shared with us about being like Jesus. I love how she said that we need to smell like Jesus and and be like Jesus and how when we have hope in Jesus, it looks irrational to the world that's hopeless, right? We need to let our hope be contagious in this world. And so this week, uh, I've titled my message, Where Are All the Miracles?, So if um, you've read many of the Bible stories, or if you haven't, maybe you've read about the flood, or Jesus walking on water, or parting the water for the Israelites to go through, or talking donkeys, or water coming out of a rock. That's a lot of water things. A lot of people getting healed, and giants getting killed. And if you're like me, you wondered, then where are all the miracles? And if God, God's word says that these signs will follow those who believe, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. Do you believe? Yeah. And I believe. And it's okay to say, where are all the miracles? In Zeal Church, though, we do see some miracles. We have been seeing healing miracles, provision miracles, other kinds of miracles. We've been seeing some miracles But I would say, I'm not content. I'm not satisfied with a few miracles here and there. I'm not content until every person has heard the word of God. Until what God says about these things following us as believers comes to pass. So if you've ever wondered, where are all the miracles I'm going to come to a story in the Bible because the Bible is our example. The Bible is our instruction book. It is a true story, the best true story you can ever read. And there's a person in there who asks that question of the Lord, where are all the miracles? So if anyone thinks that this book is boring, I would suggest that maybe they haven't read enough of it yet. There's so many crazy stories in the Bible, some of the things I just mentioned. But really, we should just be sharing all these stories and passing them down to our children, to our families, to our children's children. And that made me think of a movie scene. Don't be scared, it's not Nacho Libre this time. (laughs) How many of you have watched The Princess Bride? Yes. Yes, some. My husband strongly dislikes that movie. He doesn't, he just doesn't have good taste. (laughs) Wait, I don't know what that says about me, but. So um, I'm just gonna play a clip here for you from The Princess Bride. They're sick, that's why he's here. Why
fighting, torture, revenge, giants, monsters, chases, escapes, true love, miracles. Those are some too bad. So that obviously is not talking about the Bible. But when I see that scene and I hear the grandfather saying, my father read this to me, I read it to your father, and today I'm reading it to you. That just speaks to me of how we should be reading and telling the stories of the Bible to our children and our grandchildren. And largely the same thing is true. All those things he said really are in the Bible. Giants, miracles, true love. It's an exciting book. So I just had to share that little clip with you. But we're going to look at a story in the Bible of a man named Gideon. And that's going to be in Judges chapter 6, and starting in verse 12. But before we turn there, I just want to give you a little bit of the backstory, a little bit of the scene of what's going on where Gideon is at. So Gideon lives in Israel or with, with the Israelites. He is from Israel. And it says that the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. So in other words, they had turned away from the Lord and they were living their own lives and just doing evil. And so the Lord had given them over for a time into the Midianites' hands. So what that means is they were scared. They were living on the run, basically, and in fear of the Midianites. They would be living in dens and hiding in caves in the mountains and just afraid to really do anything. It was a severely oppressive time for the Israelites. And even so much that when they went out to try to plant their crops or take care of their livestock, the Midianites, who also partnered up with the Amalekites, these two massive groups of people, it says they were as numerous as locusts. They would just kind of descend upon the Israelites. And as soon as something tried to sprout, they would just destroy it. They destroyed the land. They destroyed their crops, their livestock, their cattle, their donkeys. And they were just barely surviving. They were being terrorized by the Midianites at this point. So then the Israelites cried out to the Lord. And this is where we see Gideon. And Gideon is actually in what they call a wine press. So it's, it's down a little bit. And he's in the wine press, but he has some wheat and he's trying to thresh the wheat. He's trying to harvest some wheat in a wine press because he thinks if he can be in there, he'll be hidden. He didn't want to be seen for fear of being raided by the Midianites. So there's Gideon, he's in a wine press, and even that tells you the severity of the uh, oppression of the Midianites, because there's normally a bunch of grapes in there, but there's no produce, there's no grapes. So I don't know how much wheat he had, but he's in there trying to just harvest a little bit of grain for his family and just living in fear that they'll find out and come and take it from him at any, at any time. So that's the setting, that's the backdrop of the story where we're going to read. If you want to turn in your Bible, or it's up on the screen here in a minute, in Judges 6, starting in chapter 12. And I'm, lead, I'm reading from the New Living Translation today. But this is what it says. The angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Gideon, and he said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And Gideon's like, Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say, the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. And the Lord said to him, I will be with you. 
and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. I just want to spend a little time and break down just these few verses with you. Because I had wanted to just kind of read the whole story of Gideon. There's so much there. There's so many signs and miracles that Gideon experiences by asking one question and by surrendering to the Lord. And I encourage you to go there and finish reading it like this week. But we're going to focus in and just look at what all is in here. Like verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, Gideon, who's hiding in fear in a wine press with some weed. And he says, he calls him a mighty hero. I'm sure that Gideon didn't feel like a mighty hero at the time. He didn't even want to be seen, but God showed up. And you know what? God always proclaims your true identity over you. He can't, he can't declare anything else other than your true identity, even if we don't see it. So then in verse 13, Gideon had replied, if the Lord is with us, why is all this happening? And he's complaining. He's complaining about the circumstance. He's complaining about, what about all this other stuff that you used to do for us? Where are you, God? And he asks that question, where are all the miracles? So he doubts the presence of the Lord. Gideon is feeling abandoned. He's living in fear. We live in any identity that the Lord hasn't given us. We react out and respond out of that identity. Fear can make us doubt. So Gideon was living in fear. And when we operate out of that place of fear, we end up doing things in a way we weren't meant to do them because we're operating out of an identity we're not meant to be in. We're, we're responding to a circumstance. We're responding, we're reacting to the fear instead of responding to the call of God on our life. So a wine press is never meant to be used to harvest wheat, right? It was never its identity. It was never made and created to have wheat pulled from it. I don't imagine that it was very effective. So when we live in an identity that God has not placed on us, we're living in a calling that the Lord has not placed on our lives, it hinders our ability to be effective. It hinders our ability to harvest for the kingdom and to do the things that God is saying that we do have the strength to do in Christ. You might think that Gideon actually was pretty creative or, you know, in, in our thoughts we think that that's pretty ingenious. He found a way to get some grain and, and hide and be, be safe. But that's us thinking about the circumstance instead of thinking through the eyes of eternity. Instead of trusting the Lord to show up and provide, to trust the calling of the Lord in our lives. When we focus on our immediate need instead of a temporary situation, that's when we're reacting to the circumstance instead of responding to the calling. And I have some photos I want to show you, and they're really just meant to be kind of a silly representation. But when you take something and you use it in a way that it wasn't intended to be used, it might kind of work, but it's not as effective. So we're going to go through a few of these photos, and we'll see what you think. Pretty clever, but... What if one of those shoes just got twisted a little or, I don't know, doesn't look so safe to me? Go ahead on the next one. I don't, I don't know. I'd, I'd move my foot back if I were him. <laughs> and the next. Okay, this guy looks pretty pleased with himself right here. He needs to get that sofa somewhere, right? He got it in his car. He did it. He accomplished the task. And when he gets there and takes it out of the car, now what happens to the purpose of the car? Or what happens the next time a storm comes? It's not gonna, the car's now not going to be as effective. Next picture. I can hardly look at this one personally. I just, I don't think I need to say anything on this one. Next. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, 
yeah, just going for a walk with my little pet, microwave. It doesn't really respond the way I want it to, but it keeps things warm sometimes. <laughs> it does sit on command, right? <laughs> Next. I don't I what he's doing, but it looks like, I don't know if you can see the fishing pole. It looks like it's in the garbage can. I'm not really sure. But he's, you know, he's doing his thing. <laughs> Next. This one was just adorable. I mean, he had the right idea, just a little bit of the wrong execution. He wasn't really getting what he had hoped. Next one. Can you see what's happening here? He's going to get that limb off. He's sawing it. He's going to get it. And he's going to get it. <laughs> Next. Right idea, sort of. Just a little skewed there. And the next one. I can't. I first thought this was his wife, and I thought, oh, but no, that's <laughs> some other guy he convinced. Hey, I need a, a work table, and I, yeah. So <laughs> that was really just meant to be kind of a silly representation, but a reminder to you, I hope those images stay with you, that when you feel like things aren't working, that you're not feeling like effective or that you know that you're operating from fear or self-consciousness or some identity that's not yours, you'll realize that you kind of look like these people up here because that was never meant to be your identity. So we have Gideon. And then in, in verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength that I, you have. Go in the strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites, and I'm sending you. The Lord only speaks truth again. Despite what Gideon thinks, the Lord has a call on his life. And this is the second time he's spoken to Gideon. And I can begin to see already that by the first word, there is already beginning to be a shift in Gideon's mindset where he went from complaining and wondering if the Lord is even real to now. He's going to say in verse 15, but Lord, how can I rescue Israel? He's now asking how. Now he's still saying my clan is the weakest. My tribe is the least and I'm, I'm the smallest or the least in my family. But the difference is the first time the Lord spoke, if you remember, he said, sir, like he didn't even recognize that it was the Lord. Now, I don't know, I, I wasn't there, but the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and he didn't recognize him. I don't know if he just appeared like a regular man, that's possible, I don't know, but I had to wonder, whenever you have moments where you know the Lord is speaking to you, but you've stopped and you've thought, no, I don't, I don't think he really wants me to pray for that person. I, I can't say that. I'm not sure that's really him. Is it just me? Is it just in my mind? Is that a figment of my imagination? I wonder if that's what Gideon was doing too. Because he first said, sir, if God is with us. And now in this reply, you see him say, but Lord, with a capital L. He's beginning to get it. The truth of the Lord is changing his mindset. And he's responding a little differently. He's now asking how. He's questioning the possibility. So one word spoken by the Lord can change you, can change your circumstance, can change your mindset. One word. In verse 16... Gideon had just asked how and, and listed all of his perceived disqualifications. And the Lord says to him, I will be with you and you'll destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Where Gideon saw weakness, the Lord saw strength. Where Gideon saw powerlessness and lack of influence, the Lord saw a mighty deliverer. Because our God is the God who calls that into being, which doesn't even exist yet. The same God who created the universe, who said, let there be life, 
and it poured out of his mouth. His promises are for you today. He speaks one word and it can change everything. Let's read Romans 4, 16 and 17. This is actually about Abraham, but it's an example of someone who also heard a declaration of the Lord or heard the calling of the Lord and believed it. And it says, the promise depends on faith so that it can be experienced as a grace gift. And now it extends to all the descendants of Abraham. The promise is not only meant for those who obey the law, but also, also to those who enter into the faith of Abraham, the father of us all. That's what the scripture means when it says, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our example and father, for in God's presence, he believed that God can raise the dead and call into being things that don't even exist yet. That is the word of God. Abraham believed what the Lord said and knew that it would happen. And in the same way, once Gideon started to believe, first he believed that it was the Lord. He went from Sir to Lord. And then his story is so full of signs and miracles. He actually asked the Lord just to confirm that he really, with the Lord's help, could accomplish defeating the Midianites. Spoiler for you, he defeats them because God said he would, right? But he asked the Lord for a sign, and I just mentioned this because he is a, the God of signs and wonders. And Gideon asked the Lord for a sign not to question or to confirm the Lord's will, but just to, to boost his confidence. And by the grace of God, he accomplished what Gideon asked him. Gideon asked, he said, I'll put a piece of wool on the threshing floor. Lord, if you are really going to help me do this, I'm going to put a piece of wool on the threshing floor. And in the morning, it'll be wet and the ground around it dry. And the Lord did it. He gets up and wrings out a bowl full of water. And then he says, okay, you feel like that that awareness and that faith for miracles is building. But he says, God, please don't be angry with me. But can you, can you just show me one more time and do the opposite? I'll put the fleece on the floor of the threshing room and it will be dry and the ground will be wet, which is even actually a bigger miracle than the other way. And the Lord did it. So Gideon goes from asking, where are all the miracles to stepping in two miracles. We need to stop letting the enemy define who we are. We need to listen to what the Lord wants to accomplish through us and allow him to speak it into being. Like Gideon, do you feel like you need a sign that the Lord actually wants to use you? Like, do you have some of those doubts? Like, I'm the smallest, I'm the least, I've done too much, I've gone too far. Do you need a sign that the Lord wants to use you? That he wants to call into being his true identity in you? I say your sign sometimes is looking around in the world that we live in. The harvest is ripe. He needs the workers to go out and bring the people into the kingdom of God, and it includes you. And I think the answer to that, if we need a sign or where are all the miracles, let's look at it again. Gideon asked the Lord, where are all the miracles? And the Lord's response was, look at Judges 6.14. The Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength I give you. Have I not sent you? Where are all the miracles, Lord? I sent you. Because greater is he that lives in us than he who's in the world. We have miracles in us because we have the kingdom of God in us. The Holy Spirit contains the whole kingdom of heaven that's available to us, in us, and through us. So it's okay to ask the Lord, where are all the miracles? But he's going to say, go. 
I sent you. Go change your workplace. Go speak my truth in your families to your children. So that's how we know God's sending us. He loves us. He's faithful. And in Romans 4, 18, talking about Abraham again, it says, against all odds, when it looked hopeless, Abraham believed the promise and expected God to fulfill it. He took God at his word, and as a result, he became the father of many nations. God's declaration over Abraham came to pass. He had told them, your descendants will be so many that they will be impossible to count. We need to start speaking the promises of the Lord, that which is not in existence yet, over our lives, over our children, over our families as if it's already happened. Now, I'm not saying that we disregard the situation or ignore it, because the fact is we're in some pretty tough situations. The fact is things are falling apart sometimes. Things are, people are hurting. But the truth is the Lord has conquered it all, and he is our hope. I just want to say, it's okay to expect God to do what he says he'll do. Because if he gives you a promise, a promise means he's going to do it, right? Sometimes we get stuck on that, oh, I can't expect God to do anything. But if he promised it, I think he kind of expects us to expect him to do what he says. It's okay to expect God to fulfill his promises in our lives. I encourage you this week to seek his promises and expect to see the fulfillment. Expect to see the change in your workplace. Expect to see that change in your children and in your marriage. And I have some declarations here. I think that it would be just powerful if I speak it out and I want you to repeat it after me. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. I am forgiven of all my sins and washed with the blood. I am delivered from the power of darkness and transferred into the God's kingdom. I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. I am greatly loved by God. Say that one again, a little more happy. I am greatly loved by God. I am more than a conqueror. I am the light of the world. I have the greater one living in me. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. I have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. I encourage you that sometimes when you don't feel like there's any peace or that there couldn't even be any peace, this is a promise. When you don't feel it, you still speak it as if it were. I have the peace of God. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And I cannot be separated from God's love. So good. <laughs> if any of you said these things, thought them, or just heard them, and you have not known the love of Jesus Christ, if you have not made a decision to follow him, but you're feeling something inside that says that maybe you want to take that step today, can we all stand together? If you want to give your life to Jesus so that these words that we just spoke would sink into your heart, they would become real to you right now today. If you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time today, would you raise your hand? Would you be bold and just raise your hand and let us celebrate with you and encourage you? 
anyone. Or maybe you've lost a little bit of your faith. You don't you didn't think that God was still the God of miracles. You were stuck thinking that God couldn't change your circumstance or that it was hopeless. If that's your situation today and you just want to have God touch you in a new way, would you just come forward? Just come up and pray. That we would all just trust the Lord. No matter if you're a new believer or you've been a believer your whole life, that you just want him to, to breathe a new faith. That miracle signs and wonders will follow you wherever you go. If that's you, would you come forward and let us pray together and have our prayer team go ahead and come up too. Thank you, Jesus. You lift your hands together and pray with me. Father, I just thank you that you are good. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you see our true identities when we only see weakness in our past. God, I pray that you just breathe on us all here today. I feel like somebody right now is, is feeling like, or maybe even hearing the words, a right turn. Like you feel like you're about to make a right turn maybe for the first time in a long time. Lord, I pray you touch that person right now. Confirm that decision in their life. Lord, I pray for an awakening, for a revival of a greater faith, of the knowledge of your goodness and the things that you say in your word that will come to pass. For those who believe, will cleanse the lepers, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. We believe, Father. We believe, Father. We ask you just to fill this place. Do a new thing. Change a mind right now. A mindset is now gone. Somebody was stuck in a mindset that is leaving right now in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father. Lord, you are good. Be with us all this week. Keep us in your word. Go before us and behind us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We have people up here. If you just want prayer for any reason, please feel free to come forward during the song and even after. But let's just worship to the Lord. And thank you so much.